Welcome everyone to our latest podcast edition of Reimagining Mobility. I'm here with Simon Fraser, Business Development for Fuel Cell Canada, our organization that uh, custom develops fuel cell stacks for the mobility space, anything from stationary power to things that fly in the air, things that float on water and obviously on the road. Simon, welcome and thank you for your time. Explain me a little bit, you're in business development, so you go to customers highlighting to them fuel cell stack technology, certainly a very key ingredient similar to what we're talking in electric vehicle, the actual battery cell, how critical it is. Why should somebody develop its, its own or his or her own fuel cell stack from the ground up, the membrane and everything else, instead of going and buying something off the shelf? That's actually a very, very good question. So the stack, in essence, is is the core of the fuel cell propulsion system. So it strongly defines how powerful, how efficient, how durable, how robust, and in the end, also how expensive uh, a fuel cell propulsion system is. Of course, you, you need the combination with the balance of plant components, the other subsystems like the thermal subsystem, but the stack has a very strong and very direct impact. So very often we talk to customers who start off having a first demo application, a few trucks, a few, uh, I don't know, a first, a first ferry application, for instance, and they start off buying a, a stack, a standardized stack, which is available off the shelf. Yeah? And for this first demo lab application, it, it's, it's good enough. So it, it works, it's available, fine. Yeah? But when you start looking beyond the first demo applications, when you start to think about a larger deployment of your product, when you start um, um, to think about the business case of selling a fuel cell based product, um, very often it's, it's clear that there's an off the shelf stack is not going to be the best solution, but uh, you want to have the best possible stack for your specific application. Mm-hmm. That's when you start to think and say, okay, what do I specifically need? Which power? Yeah? What's my efficiency target? Yeah? The form factor, for instance. Simple things which which are very important for integrating the, the stack into your vehicle, <laughs> into your marine application, um, whatever. And so that's when you start to think and say, okay, doesn't it make sense to actually have a, a custom developed stack for my specific application? And that's when we start to discuss and say, okay, yes, the stack to a certain degree, it can and it will be a differentiator for your specific product. It does make sense to consider custom developing your own stack. Not for every application, uh, mm. but for <laughs> some application, it's, it's a very, very valid um, um, consideration. And that's when we start to discuss and say, okay, what is possible if a really custom engineer stack for my specific uh, set of requirements, which, which possibilities and advantages do I have compared to buying an off-the-shelf off stack from, uh, from a stack supplier? Okay, very good. I know from years ago when we were involved with stack development for a heavy duty truck application, one of the one of the key targets was durability, right? You can't have a stack for a heavy duty truck that as opposed to a passenger vehicle is used 90% of the time versus 90% of the time sitting in my driveway or at, at work in the parking lot. Right. So when I think at that point we were talking 20 to 25,000 hours of operation. Yeah. Are we are we there now in generally speaking? Because back then that was kind of like not unreachable, but very few were able to do that. Are, are we there by now with, with that as more of a, of a, of a standard that any, any stack that not just we develop, but others develop as well, that that's sort of the, the minimum is 20 to 25 or we're not there yet? Yes. I mean, this very really strongly depends on which kind of materials, which kind of designs you apply in your specific stack. Mm-hmm. Historically, many stacks were developed for automotive applications, so plus minus 100 kilowatts and much lower durability requirements. Now we see that heavy duty trucks, long range trucks are really going to be one of the, the most important initial applications we're going to yeah. see for fuel cells. Yeah. And of course, yes, you have to meet the 25,000 hours minimum uh, lifetime requirements. And yes, you have to very carefully pick and choose which which materials you're going to use in this stack, which technologies, which designs you're going to uh, apply in, in this specific stack. If you make the right choices, 25,000 hours are possible. 
But many stacks, in particular ones which have been historically developed for automotive applications, will not be able to meet these 25,000 hours. So this, this is also one of the points where, where, of course, we have to have a deep dive with the customer to understand the application, to understand how this stack is going to be used. Uh-huh. And we can actually look into the available materials. Uh, we, can, we can have a look at the designs and we can come up with a proposal which we feel uh, confident in, in saying yes, this stack is going to survive the 25,000 hours you request. And of course, it is not just the design of the stack. We also have um, a lab full of, of test beds. We have methodologies um, to, to do what we call accelerated stress testing. You're never going to test a stack for 25,000 hours on the test bed. But you <laughs> somehow have to accelerate this. You have to squeeze this into a few days, a few weeks of testing. And it takes a lot of, of experience and experienced test engineers to understand how to translate 25,000 hours of operation on, on, on the highway into a few weeks of, of testing on a test bed. Uh-huh. And we have these, these um, 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 accelerated stress tests. We can translate um, real world operation into something we can um, um, execute on, on a test bed. And uh, so it, it's not just you know designing to meet 25,000 hours, it's also being able to provide confidence to the customer that the stack we design is actually going to be able to meet these um, very ambitious requirements. Sure. I mean, 25,000 hours is still quite ambitious today. Yeah? It's not an easy task to achieve, but it's achievable. Okay. So you talked a little bit about design. You talked about material. Maybe I assume with that comes a certain cost. How, how big is the trade-off if I want to get, let's say, let's use this twenty to 25,000. Is the trade-off less on the design side, but more on using different materials? Is it, is it it's both design, material, and, and cost goes up? Or, or how, how do we look at that, depending on, again, if we're purely looking at operation, not, not efficiency, not whatever, X kilowatts per liter, forget that for a moment, but getting to the getting to the, the durability, the, the, the time, right? The hours, what, what is the main trade-offs I have to look at there? I mean, it's, it's uh, you're gonna start by looking into which kind of materials you wanna apply in, in your stack. You have catalyst coated membranes, gas diffusion layers, bipolar plate materials. So this already has a very, very, very important impact on, on the lifetime you're gonna see in, in uh, your stack. Yeah? Mm. And uh, since since we custom engineer stacks, we of course we can pick and choose different technologies, different materials on the market. Yeah, so we we're not we don't, we, ha- we haven't invested into a manufacturing facility where we cannot simply change and and use a different membrane, for instance, or a different catalyst coated membrane. Yeah, so we we are an R and D organization. We benchmark different materials. We see what which which te- supplier technologies are available. So we can pick and choose the best supplier technologies for a specific application. So number one, really choosing the right materials. Yeah? Then, of course, the next step is, is component design and designing the complete stack. Yeah? There's very, very important decisions you have to do in the design phase, which have a strong impact, not just on performance and efficiency, but also durability um, of your stack. And something which 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 cannot be um, um, overestimated is is how important this this um, um, interaction between the stack and the fuel cell system is. Yeah, and the good thing is that in our organization AVL we can cover stack development as well as system integration. Mm-hmm. And so the fuel cell system is going to operate the stack. Yeah? So the operating strategy, the operating parameters which 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 we allow the stack to be exposed to. Yeah? have a very strong impact on the durability, on the lifetime of the stack. Yeah? So we as stack developers, we're going to have a very, very important discussion at the interface between the stack and the system. We're going to tell the system people what our stack is, is, is able to handle. Yeah? We're going to make sure that our stack is not going to be exposed to critical operating conditions. Or if it has to be exposed, we're going to try to limit the exposure time as far as possible. And the combination of a good control strategy, a good operating strategy of the stack, and a well-designed stack applying the right materials is what's actually going to make the stack survive the 25,000 hours, even in real world um, I'm driving, not just in, 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 in laboratory conditions. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
So some of us or some people are probably listening to this saying, here we go again, software has taken over the world. Uh-huh. Now it's also in fuel cell stacks, software again, controls everything. Uh, clearly what we do in, 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 in Canada, right, with, with, with the group that you're working with is, is the development of the stack. But the key component that you're bringing out is at the end, yes, it's software that controls and makes sure it runs at its optimal operation range and, again, allows to to meet certain conditions that the customer wants. So I guess how much more do you see software playing a role in in improving efficiency and improving uh, durability uh, and improving the applications in in different areas of, of a fuel cell stack or of a fuel cell stack based power plant do you see software sort of already playing its 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 part as it will in the future or will software just like it is in in vehicles play even a bigger role going forward yeah. i mean the, the stack itself it's it's an interesting animal because you don't have any active components in the stack mm-hmm. itself so it's completely passive right? so you you have to have compressors humidifiers heat exchangers um, making sure that the stack has can be operated as safely and efficiently as, as, as possible. So the control system of the fuel cell system and even the control system of the vehicle are going to play a very, very important role in making sure that the stack um, operates as, as, as it's supposed to operate. Yeah? And this is not just true in normal operating conditions, but in particularly also when, when you when you want to, to, to turn on the stack, uh, maybe it's frozen, for instance, after a cold winter night, and you have to decide how is, how is my strategy um, for unfreezing the stack? Uh, um, what was my strategy when I have a big truck fully loaded going up a hill, for instance? Yeah, How am uh-huh. I gonna, gonna make sure that, that um, the stack is, is, is gonna provide the performance I need yeah, without compromising um, the durability, um, which, which I still wanna have from, from my stack? Yeah? So as I mentioned before, this 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 cooperation between the control system guys and us as as stack guys is very very crucial in making sure that the stack um, is 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 going to survive and perform as as it's supposed to perform. Yeah, in particular, if you also have a, include a certain um, um, element of of battery capacity in in, in your vehicle. Yeah? so you have different choices. Um, um, you have a certain level of of, of flexibility. Um, and if you have a clever control strategy, yeah, you can make sure that the stack survives much longer than if, if you just apply brute force and try to squeeze out as much power as possible. And then you just, you're surprised when the stack doesn't, doesn't uh, meet the durability requirements. Mm-hmm. So software, after all, again, is, is uh, in control here as well. Let's talk a little bit maybe about something that over the last, again, AVL is now 75 years old uh, or going on 75 years and continuing. Much of that time we've spent in diesel and gasoline engines. Over the last 20 years, getting into EVs with battery development, inverters, lots of different things. Over the last five to 10 years, heavily into fuel cell stacks as well. But on internal combustion engines or diesel engines, and now also batteries, a big play of software is also diagnostics, right? Making sure that the engine runs properly, that we have the capability of diagnosing issues, but also prognosis so that we can look forward. Hey, this is something, a value we see here. We use our data intelligence capabilities to predict something, again, both in, in engines and, and batteries. Tell me a little bit, what is what, how does this play into, into the stack, into the fuel cell stack? Because you said before, it's really a, a passive device. Are we not doing any diagnostics then? Right. So, so we have to distinguish between between what we do in the in the research and development phase and what we do in the actual application. So when the stack is in use. So in research and development, we have a lot of, of diagnostic capabilities, um, which of course we also need to understand what's going on with our prototype stacks. A prototype stack is expensive. Uh, you don't want to damage it. You want to understand what's going on. You want to extract as much information as as possible. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So we have, um, you know, traditional um, tools like like cell voltage monitoring systems, which allow us to to understand what each specific cell during a test run is 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 experiencing. We also have advanced tools like like um, I'm looking into segmented cells, which which indicate current density distribution across the whole um, area of active area of, of the stack. 
which indicates if, if the stack is uniformly operated or if you have certain errors in, 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 your, in your stack where you have, I don't know, significantly higher or significantly lower current densities, which provides, of course, important input to the stack designers. Yeah. We have stuff like impedance spectroscopy, for instance, which is a very interesting tool in particular for single cell um, analysis, where you can understand what's happening on the electrochemical um, um, level, where you can see how stuff like, like membrane dehydration, for instance, changes um, um, the performance. So all of this is, is, is helping us in, in understanding what's going on with our prototypes. And of course, providing input in, in a feedback loop uh, to the stack designers, of course, always coupled with modeling and and, and simulation. Sure, so that's also a very important aspect. Yeah, so, so really trying to close the loop between uh, the stack design or component level design, um, building testing prototypes on the test bed, and feeding this back into the simulation, which again then supports us in in improving, let's say, the design of our bipolar plate. Um, or let's see, I don't know, a certain, certain um, um, feature of, 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 of the stack. Yeah. So in R&D, a, a lot of diagnostic tools, a lot of capabilities. Um, that, that's one side of the story. On the other hand, you're going to have um, a stack at some point operated in, in an actual vehicle. And also there you have to try to understand um, which, which diagnostic capabilities do you actually need in your vehicle. Yeah. And what we've seen is that traditionally, a um, few years ago, there was a lot of, still a lot of diagnostic tools directly built into the stack, cell voltage monitoring systems, for instance, yeah? uh -huh. which is quite an expensive um, way of, of, of understanding what's going on in your stack, but it provides a lot of, of, of value. Yeah? As we're now um, um, slowly going into the direction of mass production, you can see that, of course, companies are trying to reduce um, the level of, of diagnostic capabilities built into their vehicles to make them cheaper. But this is only possible if you are confident um, uh, in, in the stack, in the stack design and the quality of the materials going into the stack, which, of course, is, again, something which, to a certain degree, is already going to be decided in the R&D phase yeah? when you select which materials you want to sure. use. Yeah? And in the validation we do in our in our lab, yeah? so when we develop a, a stack prototype, um, the whole validation, experimental validation, testing prototypes in our lab in realistic operating conditions, making a free startup testing, for instance, again and again, yeah? all of this contributes to the level of confidence we have in our product, which will eventually allow our customers to reduce the level of of expensive diagnostic capabilities they need in, in, in the vehicles. Yeah? But that's a, that's, a, that's a gradual transition. And it's a general transition we're seeing in a, in a, in a lot of aspects of fuel cell design in the availability of, of new materials, for instance, yeah? or the maturity of the designs. You can see that, that um, a few years ago, we were still trying to have you know, a few hundred stacks maybe uh, manufactured by hand, assembled by hand. Yeah? Happy if they actually work in the vehicle. And now <laughs> we see customers say, okay, I want to have a few 10,000 units um, next year. I want to have a few hundred thousand units in a few years from now. Uh -huh. So if they're thinking in different dimension, which also is, is an input for us because um, it means that we're not just going to look into stuff like, like performance and robustness, but we're also going to bring production engineering engineers into the projects, cost yeah. engineers, yeah, um, defining target costs, really trying to not just make the best possible stack, but make the stack easy to assemble, yeah, efficient to assemble, yeah, uh, making sure that the quality can be easily checked. Yeah? So these are aspects which are completely normal in automotive industry, yeah, but to a certain degree, they still have to be translated and implemented in, in fuel cell industry. And it's, it's, it's very... It's very interesting to be part of, of this transformation. Um, and for me, this, this, this whole transformation is, is really a key to, in the end, have cost-effective stacks produced in large numbers and really ready to, to um, um, be operated in large fleets, whether it's commercial vehicles, whether it's in, in maritime applications, for instance, or in stationary applications. Um, there's a lot of, of automotive know-how which we can transfer into the fuel cell industry this this can be a very significant contribution also we as abl can can bring into fuel cell industry 
in terms of supporting this this ramp up um, of 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 the industry. Very good. It really ties directly into my last question that I had is from 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 you from a business development point of view. What have you seen over the last? two to three years change. And I think you just explained that, right? We, we're, now, we're now going to a point, not any more laboratory or can we do it or feasibilities. We're going now into, okay, let's take this, but let's make it manufacturable. Let's make it scalable, right? At scale, at quality, et cetera. Yes. I guess with, with that already answered, well, let me add a, an add-on question to that. I still ask question. What do you see then happening over the next two years? You see additional changes relates to what people come to you and say, "Hey, we need help with this now." Or do you see this is now we're at now? Now we're where we're at now. We're just going to continue. It's just going to be more because fuel cell and fuel cell stacks, as a result of it, is becoming more prevalent in the in the mobility space. Or what do you see from a customer demand that we can then suffice at Avial? Do uh, you see over the next two or three years? I mean, first of all, we're still in, in in a in a phase where where we as AVL we 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 see uh, or we are we are you know getting a, a requests from a lot of different customers, which are not typical AVL customers, yeah. So non automotive customers uh -huh. um, working on aviation applications, maritime applications, trains, for instance. Yeah. Uh, so it's interesting for us to work with these customers and to see which kind of requirements they have. Yeah. And of course, some of these requirements are quite similar, whereas some industries have very, very specific requirements, which really have a fundamental impact on how we have to design um, stacks, which materials we can use and how these stacks are being operated. Um, in terms of, of, of maturity, um, at, at this point, we still have a mix of some customers really each starting new and, and working on the first stack and, and planning the first demo applications. But on the other hand, we already have some customers who are, you know, a few steps ahead, and already thinking in in, in bigger dimensions. You know, thinking in direction of, of mass production, mm. uh, bigger production volumes. So what I expect is that in the next couple of years, we're going to have more and more customers um, going into the direction of of mass production, having more emphasis on 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 the production engineering, on on, on target costing, for instance. Um, taking a few steps closer to large volume um, um, applications. So I think this is a trend um, um, we're going to see. Um, on the one hand, on the other hand, as I mentioned before, fuel cells is, is, is going to be a topic in so many different industries. And certain industries just kind of discovered fuel cells quite recently. Yeah? And, you, and you're also going to see um, um, these companies slowly but surely moving from first demo applications, small volume applications, into the direction of, of really, you know, having products ready to be sold into mass market applications. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this is definitely something um, we're right in the middle of, of this um, um, transition process. And you can also see regional differences. Yeah? So, so what's happening in Asia is, is, is a bit different to what's happening in Europe, which is, again, a bit different to what's happening in, happening in, in, in the US. Sure. But the general trend is, is something we can see globally. And that's good for fuel cell industry because there's, there's a huge demand for for um, for good, for robust, for for cost-effective fuel cell solutions um, for all the different applications we're going to see. And uh, we as AVL were pretty well prepared to to handle these requests and to provide um, um, solutions which are mature and and ready for these real-world applications. Very good. Thank you, Simon, for your time. Excellent and, and very insightful and interesting for me, for me to learn here. And thanks everybody else for tuning in. Until the next time, thank you. Thanks for listening to Reimagine Mobility Podcast. If you liked this episode, please subscribe and tell a friend.